Hello. Yeah, so you know a talk is going to be really great when you have to start it out with basically the dog ate my homework. <laughs> uh, but it did happen. Uh, I finished my slides like five minutes ago, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> I'm excited to see how this presentation is. I hope it's good. Um, <laughs> so hi, my name is Andrew Clark. I'm an engineer at OpenGov. Today I want to talk to you about what I want to call post-React UI architectures. I also thought about calling this like React adjacent architectures because they're not really in the post-React era, I guess. It's more just they came after React. They take inspiration from some of React's core ideas, but diverge or move beyond them in some key ways. So to frame this, why, why do this? Why is this a useful exercise? You've probably noticed a theme throughout much of this conference of looking to other libraries and frameworks for inspiration. And um, we've had a few really good talks about this so far. The React e ecosystem has been shameless in stealing from other communities. And I mean that as a good thing, if you, obviously. So on an individual level, the reason it's good is that it makes us better engineers. We've heard, you've heard that today. And if you're like me, you often hear people say things like, React made me a better JavaScript developer. Well, similarly, learning about React alternatives is going to make you a better React developer. And on a community level, it pushes us forward and leads us to some really cool projects, like Redux. Another goal of this talk, and this is another theme that we've discussed particularly, particularly today, is to serve as kind of a high-level intro to functional programming. Many of these post-React or React-adjacent libraries and frameworks, like React itself, follow some FP principles. Uh, functional programming is something that many of us have become interested in since using React. I know it's especially true for me. Um, but if your experience is mostly in imperative style programming, as mine is and was, uh, learning about it can be pretty overwhelming. You're bombarded with all these new concepts, strange, incomprehensible syntax that makes no sense, uh, and mathematical sounding jargon, you know, monad, monads and all that garbage. So. For this talk, I'm going to try and skip the jargon, because I barely understand it myself. And I'm going to spare you any new syntax and attempt to present these concepts in terms that will be uh, relatable for a React developer. And so in fact, all the code I'm going to show you today is in JavaScript and React. The frameworks I'm going to focus on are Elm, and specifically the Elm architecture. Um, less so the language itself, which Jameson did a really good job um, giving you like a high-level overview of it and Cycle, um, which many of you have probably heard of. Uh, it's a data flow library that's based on observables. Uh, by the way, I also originally wanted to cover Ohm. I think that's in the talk description. I had to cut it for time. Um, but it's really cool. I don't mean to suggest that it's any less interesting than these other frameworks, just the limits of the format. But fortunately, we heard about that earlier, too. But ultimately, the title of this talk is Back to React for a Reason. This is really a talk about React and how to make our applications better by stealing shamelessly from other libraries and frameworks. So hopefully, in the process, we can learn more about what makes React special at the same time. So in that spirit, before we get into Elm Recycle, I want to talk a little bit about React components. Often in blog posts and talks at this conference, we've seen a few versions of this, you'll see a formula that looks like this. Um, this is essentially saying views are a function of data, uh, or React components are a function of data. This is an ele elegant formulation that communicates some key things about React, that it's declarative, and that it's all about inputs and outputs. But while the formula is useful, it's not strictly true, right? Because it implies that React components are pure functions. If that were true, then the only way to update your view, to update your app, would be to give a component new data. And when we say data, we mean props in this context, right? Because props are the thing you give to a component. Yet as we know, components have the ability to update themselves. They can have local state. In other words, you can say that they have side effects. They can communicate directly with the outside world. So this is an important distinction versus a framework like Elm, whose views literally are pure functions and rely on a separate system for managing effects and updates. 
So if we're going to compare functional inspired UI architectures, state is an important topic because it's an important topic in functional programming. Um, and it relates to this idea of purity versus impurity. We've also discussed this at this conference. Uh, purity is desirable for reasons that are likely familiar to all of you. Um, they're predictable, they're testable, uh, they're declarative, uh, they're good for if you're run, they're easily parallelizable. Um, so generally the goal is to maximize the pure part of your program and minimize the impure part. Impure code, of course, is necessary to communicate with the outside world, of course, e.g. via events like button clicks or um, keyboard events. So functional programs have to be rigorous in how they coordinate between the impure and the pure part. So one way to think about this is that new information in a program, think mouse events, keyboard events, gestures, etc., cetera, uh, is always impure by definition since it comes from the outside world. Before it can be used by the pure part of our application, which is hopefully most of the code that we write, it somehow has to be purified. This is an imperfect analogy, but, and I just made it up like two minutes ago, so it might not make any sense, but events are kind of like crude oil, right? And you have to refine it before you put it into your car, which is our app. So yeah, lame analogy, but let's, let's take a look at how this idea of pure versus impure applies to each framework. Um, in React, we already mentioned that functional components are pure, but uh, the pure versus impure distinction happens uh, in class components as well. So if we look at an example class component, and I just kind of stole this from the React um, main docs page, like the readme, the, the docs. Uh, if we look at this example, it's clear that there's some impure stuff going on here because we're using set interval and we're attaching it to the instance. Um, but if you kind of squint, there's a part here that is a little bit pure. You can think of it as pure, and that is the render method. You're thrown off a little bit by that this.state.seconds. It's accessing local state. But conceptually, we can think of render as a pure function for a given set of props and state. And this is actually the one, one of the first things we learn as React developers, right, is to keep side effects out of render and just simply output a view using the current props and state. So I've done this thing that I'll do for each framework where we have these three columns. So in React, the impure part is set state and the lifecycle methods. Um, the pure part, uh, quote unquote, is the render method. And then we have this thing in between that has to coordinate between the pure and the impure part. And in React, um, that's like when you pass props, right? Because state is, all state in React is local to the component. And that keeps our components isolated and maintainable. So when you pass a prop to a child component, it doesn't know if that's coming from state or anything else. It just knows it's a prop. So let's compare this to Cycle. Cycle doesn't have an imperative API like set state. Instead, it describes data flow using an asynchronous primitive called observables. Uh, observables are streams of data. They represent values that change over time. They're often conflated with events because you can subscribe to them. But the thing that makes observables special is that you can apply composable stream transformation to them. You shouldn't be making lots of subscriptions. That's the mistake I made when I first was trying to learn about them. So th uh, these composable stream transformations are very important. For instance, and I apologize if I was unsure if I wanted to put this slide up here. This is from a really cool website called Rx Marbles, which you may have heard of. Um, hopefully this makes sense. On the top you have a stream. Um, of values spread out over time, the, the line represents time. Uh, and on the, in the middle you have the transformation we're applying to it, and on the bottom you have the resulting stream again spread out over time. So this one, hopefully you can decipher. Um, we're taking an, ori an original stream and we're filtering any of the values that are um, not over 10, essentially. Uh, so here's another example. This is map, this is just, you know, it's, essential, it's like any other mapping function except you're doing it over a sequence and not just a single value. Um, we're just multiplying it by 10. Here's another one, scan. If this should look a little bit familiar. Scan is, a little, is like reduce. Um, uh, with, for each value we're at, where represents the sum of all of the values in the sequence up to that point. Um, so if you're familiar with Redux, this is a good way to implement a Redux style uh, data flow in observables. 
But so the key thing to understand about these transformations, and you can, there's a lot more examples online, uh, rxmarbles.com, I think it is. The key is that when you apply a transformation to a stream, you're not changing the original stream. You're creating a new derived stream. This means you can e express complex data flows without lots of subscriptions. In fact, many apps only have a single subscription, and it's handled by the framework, not in your actual user code. So here's, um, again, I ripped this off straight from the Cycle website. Here's a diagram of how data flow generally works in Cycle. Um, on the top, we have our application, a function called main, which is essentially just one big stream transformer. Remember, streams and observables are, are synonymous here. Uh, it's a function that takes in input streams called sources and outputs streams called sinks. Again, when you transform a stream, you're not actually modifying the original stream. You're just uh, creating a new stream that's derived from the original one. On the bottom, we have these things called drivers. And these are a really clever abstraction for dealing with side effects. And this is the part that communicates with the outside world. All communication with the outside world has to go on inside, inside of a driver. Uh, drivers provide the sources for our apps, uh, and they receive the sinks. Uh, so as you can see, this is like a unidirectional data flow, just like in Flux uh, or React, a similar concept. So in case this doesn't make sense, let's walk through the most common driver, um, which will be the most relatable to a React audience, per perhaps, which is the DOM driver. That's that top one in the driver section down there. The DOM driver listens for user events, like button clicks, keyboard presses, et cetera, and passes them into your main function, into your application code. Your application applies transformations to those events to produce an output stream of virtual DOM elements. And then that stream of elements is returned back to the DOM driver as a sync, which takes that DOM representation and mutates the, ac uh, the actual DOM using the virtual DOM representation. So that should sound pretty familiar. And there are other types of drivers, including ones for HTTP requests, for interacting with the history API. Um, there's even an experimental driver for React Native. You could even just use normal React. Um, most people don't. Uh, they use the virtual DOM driver. But there's nothing stopping you, because this is really just a data flow abstraction. It's not anything that's tied to any particular kind of um, view primitive. So drivers are a fairly neat, flexible abstraction that solves this pure versus impure problem in, a, in an interesting way. So let's plug this into our chart. On the left, you have drivers, which are impure. Um, the pure part is your main function, which is it's one big stream transformer that's composed of some smaller parts of your app. Uh, and then the in-between thing that I'm calling it uh, is, are your sources and your sinks. Uh, arguably, maybe the drivers are in-between. I don't know. This isn't perfect. But the idea is you have something that's coordinating between the pure part of your code and the impure part. Oh, wait. Sh let me go back. Um, so in a real cycle app, you'll ha actually have multiple of these data flow components um, like that. That's the data flow component. You're going to have multiple of those data flow components that follow that diagram, which compose together into a single program. I don't have time to go into the details of that, but it's conceptually similar to how the Elm architecture works, which we are going to discuss here in a bit. So some of the high-level benefits of the, of the cycle architecture are, you know, observables are a good abstraction, arguably. There's some controversy, but... Good abstraction for expressing complex asynchronous logic using stream transformations. It's highly declarative, so your application code is written using pure functions. And drivers are a nice abstraction for dealing with impure code. It allows um, the bulk of the code that you write to be nice and predictable and pure and testable and all that good stuff. So surely this is way different than how React works, right? Well, yes and no, I would say. The update cycle is different in React. but I think there may be something to the idea of components as essentially stream transformers. So let's explore that idea real quick. Let's go back to our formula. We discussed why this formula isn't complete, because it doesn't express how updates work. When you render a React component, it doesn't just return a single unchanging view. If the component is stateful, like that timer component we were looking at earlier, it's going to return many views over time. In the timer example, every single second. It's going to render a new string. So let's think about how we can adapt this formula slightly to accommodate this idea of returning multiple 
views over time. So this isn't jQuery, this is a convention, don't worry, uh, this is a convention that Cycle uses to indicate that something is a stream. Um, so now what we have here is we're saying a component is a function of data that returns a stream of views. And this description is a bit closer, perhaps, to how React components work. But the right-hand side is still maybe not quite right. Because when you mount a component, it's not just receiving a single set of props over its entire life cycle. It's going to receive multiple sets of props before it eventually unmounts. And because components may accumulate state over time, the seventh render of a component isn't necessarily going to return the same output as the 17th render. So let's think about this. The nth render of a function is not a function of a single set of props. It's a function of a sequence of props, all of the props that have ever been sent to that component over time. So let's update this one more time. Oh, sorry. I forgot to advance, but that's just what I just said. OK, so now we have the data. Again, this is props, these, these props and when we're talking about React. Now we say that a, compo a component is a function that transforms a stream of data or props into a stream of views. So notice how our updated function f is now very similar to the main function that we were looking at in that Elm diagram. It's a stream transformer. So this isn't perfect still. Like, it's not an ideal, still not an ideal description of how React components work, but and, and it also doesn't cover all of the surface area of the React component API. But as it turns out, the idea of a React component as essentially a stream transformer actually works pretty well. And I can prove this by giving you this example. So let's say we have a component called, or a function, a helper, called create component. And it accepts a single parameter, and that is a function in the form of f that we just saw on the previous slide which is a function that takes a stream of props from the owner and emits a stream of React elements, which we're just going to call VDOM here. Um, so when you pass this function to create component, it's going to return just a regular old React component that you can render just like any other. So for instance, here's how we would implement that, that class timer that we saw earlier. The, functionally, it's the exact same thing as that class component, but you can see we're using this create component helper that we just imagined. Um, if you can't read this, uh, I'll step through it a little bit. Observable.interval, basically, it cr it's an RxJS um, function or helper. It, it creates an observable that emits an, a new value every second. Um, scan, is we, we talked about that. That's just essentially adding one to, um, to n every single second so that the value at any time is the, to is the number of uh, things that have been emitted from the source. And then at the end, we just map that accumulated value to some React elements. Um, very simple div there. Um, and there you go. You, it outputs this thing here. So the same exact, um, I'm not going to scroll all the way. Eh, that's not valuable. So it's the same exact thing as that class component we saw earlier, but you know, arguably, it's a little bit easier to track the data flow in this if you're, at least if you're used to observables. I realize that if you're not, this might not make any sense, but hopefully it does. Here's another slightly more complex example. This is a, I stole this idea from the um, Elm architecture uh, tutorial, which has a similar thing. Um, so th this is just fetching random GIFs from, is it GIFs or GIFs? Half of you are going to say I'm wrong. So. <laughs> I'm going to say GIF. Um, this fetches a random GIF from Jiffy Giffy uh, <laughs> whenever you update the input. Uh, and does some other special things, like it's going to debounce uh, whenever it fetches so that it doesn't fetch on every single, um, on every single key press. This distinct until change is a nice helper in RxJS that just um, we'll skip over values that are equivalent to the previous value, which is important so that if like, the, you have a re-render and the same exact prop is sent to you, even if it hasn't changed, it doesn't try and fetch again. Um, and then we already know about map. So hopefully, hopefully you can follow this. We're essentially just taking uh, the topic from the prop stream. So this time we actually are using that source prop stream. Um, we are 
there's this thing called flat map, which if you don't understand that, don't worry. It's just it's getting a promise and it's flattening it back into the stream. Uh, and then it maps that to some uh, React elements like we did last time. Um, so if this were my original talk, I would compare this to the class component version of this. But you can imagine that if you were doing this as a normal class, it's not going to be this expressive. You're going to have to do some weird set state stuff. You're going to have to use a debounce function. And it's going to be a little bit more complicated. So for these asynchronous operations, arguably, observables are a nice way to do that type of stuff. Um, and what is essentially like, what, seven? I can't count. Seven lines? Um, so yeah. So. Observables in React can be a nice pattern. It's not great for everything. For example, if you need to mess with the DOM uh, directly, probably should just use a class. Uh, and it's not as pure of an abstraction as Cycle. But React's API is designed in such a way that it makes experiments like this really easy to implement. So in case you think that that create component thing was a terrible hack and with lots of really gross code underneath the hood, uh, it's actually like fewer than 50 lines long, and it's pretty straightforward. It's just using component will receive props. Um, and if, it's also not fully reactive the way that you could argue that Cycle is fully reactive, because React is still controlling the flow of props across components. Um, we're not actually taking control of all of the data flow. We're just the data flow inside of a component um, in between when it receives props and when it actually uh, renders. So next, let's talk about the Elm architecture. So again, um, Jameson did, or had a really good talk about Elm the language. We're going to talk about the Elm architecture, which um, maybe or maybe you have not heard of. So in an Elm application, as in Cycle, your app is essentially made of these really big monolithic functions. But unlike Cycle, rather than operating on streams of values, Elm applications operate on discrete values, so there's no notion of time the way in observables um, have a notion of time. Streams do exist in Elm. They're called signals. Not exactly the same thing as observables, but they're similar in spirit. If you understand one, you can probably understand the other. Um, but in the Elm architecture, they're mostly in implementation detail. You can, make, you can really make fairly complex apps in Elm without knowing what the hell a signal is at all. So we've talked about how Elm views are pure functions, which means that they can't have imperative APIs like set state. So if they can't use set state and they don't operate on streams like cycle and everything has to be pure, how do we model local state in Elm? So the way it works is every component in Elm exports not only a view, but also an update function. And update functions are functions that take the current state and an action and compute a new state using that. So maybe this sounds familiar. That's because update functions in Elm are exactly like reducers. Um, the Elm architecture is basically Redux, but for components. It's probably more accurate to say that Redux is a subset of the Elm architecture, um, not vice versa, just to be clear. <laughs> so where Redux is concerned primarily with application level states, so state that's important to your entire application usually, um, for instance, if you think about the way a lot of people use Redux, which is to do data, fetch data fetching, um, if you fetch a bunch of posts, um, that's state that your entire application might care about, or at least one or more components might care about. But Elm is concerned with local state. It's more comparable to as a replacement for um, a set state API at the component level. So Elm apps are essentially made from two big functions, a big update reducer composed of smaller reducers, and a big view composed of smaller views. So you can imagine that the view composition works uh, pretty similarly to any other kind of function composition, or the way that you compose stateless functions in React, except you don't have this intermediate thing like a React element. It's just uh, a function that returns some, um, a description of some virtual DOM. Uh, so when an event happens in Elm, it is turned into an action and sent through that big, giant monolithic reducer to calculate a new state tree. And like Redux, the state tree is just a single immutable value. Then the new state, or model, as they call it in Elm, is sent to the giant view, the big composed view, to generate a new virtual DOM description. Because Elm apps are made of these gigantic monolithic functions, um, updates always happen from the top. So this requires a bit of cleverness in how we design our component modules. 
The key to the Elm architecture is the actions inside actions pattern. It's a bit hard to explain unless you've actually done it or seen it. I probably looked at it, I've read through the docs like several times before I truly understood it. Um, and it wasn't until after like Redux was a thing that it clicked like some sort of weird reverse inception um, that, this is, that we had essentially been doing the same thing in Redux as Elm had been doing the whole time. Um, by the way, this is the part of the talk that would benefit from a really nice animation, which I promise you my original presentation totally had the, the coolest animation. Um, <laughs> when a component in Elm dispatches an action, um, but it's not called dispatch, by the way, in Elm, but I'm gonna describe this in terms of JavaScript. Uh, it's actually dispatching a nested action that looks kind of like this. Um, so you have this meta action um, with a type, and then you have a payload, which is just another nested action inside of it. So the parent component is responsible for unwrapping that interaction and calling the corresponding update function. So the second part of this is we don't want the inner function to have to think about nesting actions. It shouldn't be aware of its owner at all. So we don't want to actually construct these weird nested, and imagine there's like more than two levels, it's gonna be even bigger than that. Yeah, we don't want to have to have to worry about that. So we give that responsibility to the, to the owner. Before the owner passes the dispatch prop down to the child component, it's gonna wrap that dispatch, um, kind of like, it, like an enhancer, if, if, if you remember that. Um, it's gonna wrap that dispatch uh, function or method um, in something like this so that the, when the action is dispatched, it's actually being dispatched inside of a, of a meta action. This way the child thinks it's dispatching normal actions even though it's dispatching this bigger thing. So here's an example of what this might look like in, um, in JavaScript and React. So at the top you have this init thing, it's kind of like get initial state, in this case we're just keeping track of a string, so don't, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, it might be, it, in other components it'd probably be, be like an object or a record. Update is a reducer, so I don't have to explain that to you. Um, this is a view, um, this is the third part of an Elm component is the view. Um, this is just a React component in the way that we're implementing this. Uh, it's gonna re receive two special props, model and dispatch. Um, model is just the, the state that corresponds to that component, and dispatch is like dispatch in Redux. Uh, and so then, uh, this is pretty naively implemented, but uh, as the event handlers for the input and the button, uh, we're just gonna dispatch an action uh, when those events fire, and that will, by the, by the framework, be uh, handled, it will send the action to update, calculate a new model, and then re-render. So at the bottom there, on in the, in the final line, we see this function called start. So that's kind of like that create component function that we saw earlier when we were talking about RxJS. Just imagine it's a function that exists that takes these three Elm style modules and turns them into a normal React component. Again, it's just a React component so you can render it in any context whatsoever and the consuming owner component has does not have to have any clue that you were transgressing by using this stupid architecture. Um, so here's an example of this nested pattern. So um, the, this is the same component we were looking at earlier, except I forgot to mention that the actual inputs, those input boxes, are using the Elm, this Elm style pattern. Um, the reason I did it this way is that you'll notice that we have a mixture of two different architectures here. Not only are we using React, um, we're also using the Elm architecture to do the, um, the that in input box, and we're using the that RxJS cycle the architecture to do the GIF fetching, and neither of them has to know about the other what the other one's doing because they're both just React components. Uh, so that was the idea I was trying to communicate there. Um, and then the other uh, idea you want to look at here is that we have two instances of this Elm style component um, that are, and by the way, this is just exactly what we're looking at uh, here, is that we have, I realize I forgot to kind of walk, walk through that, but we have, um, uh, sorry. Oh, I screwed up that slide. See, this is, this is what happens when you, when you make the presentation two minutes before you give it. Um, so in, in the model, essentially, we're storing the, uh, I apologize. It, basically, in the model, and I'm gonna post this online so you can play with it yourself and don't have to watch me stumble, but basically in the model, we're, sto we're storing two 
um, two models, we're nesting two models inside of it, um, and then we're passing those models down as props. So screwed up the slide, but hopefully when you look at it online, if you ever do, uh, it will make more sense. Um, so yes, this essentially lets us uh, keep all of our state in one big object, uh, and even though, uh, and while still maintaining this isolated property, um, so each component doesn't have to be aware of the other co uh, components. Also notice that, and this, this scales fairly well, also notice that there, there are no selectors here. That's one advantage. You don't have to have selectors because um, everything is just co-located with the view that they are interested in. Um, again, this works for component state pretty well. It wouldn't work if you were trying to do more like application level state. Um, it'd be a little bit more complicated. So some disadvantages, you'll notice that there's a lot of ceremony involved in doing that nested action inside of actions pattern. And since JavaScript lacks features like strong types and pattern matching, it makes Elm strictness about things like side effects harder to stomach. Another disadvantage is that because updates always occur from the top, you have to be really careful about performance. In React, you can mostly take performance for granted because when a component calls set state, it's only updating that component and all of its descendants. Uh, but when you render from the top all the time, you have to have a way to cut off subtrees from re-rendering. Elm does this using a function called lazy, and there's a few functions called lazy, um, which works pretty much just like the peer render mix in React. It implements should component update, and it returns false if all of the props um, are referentially equal, um, or just equal in the case of Elm. It's not impossible to do this if you use the Elm architecture in React. Like I said, you can just use should component update. Um, but it is another thing, extra thing that you have to be really careful about. That being said, uh, there's still some benefits, and they're the same benefits that you have with Redux. Reducers are really easy to test. Um, Whiz-bang features like hot module replacement and time travel are pretty straightforward. And this is also the part where um, you pretend that I implemented that here. Um, serialization is very easy, again, because it's just one big object. Um, also, we have already have so many cool Redux extensions out there that if you wanted to, all of those are easily portable to a system like this. Um, in fact, this is where you imagine that I had a Redux DevTools example running um, on that GIF component, which I totally did in my original, uh, I promise, in my original presentation. Um, by the way, also I should mention that the Redux DevTools themselves implement that this nested actions inside of actions pattern, which is essentially the Elm architecture, which is pretty cool. So if you ever want to look at how the Redux DevTools are architected and also get a, gain a little bit more insight into the origins of Redux, because the DevTools really drove a lot of the, the initial design of Redux, um, that'd be a good homework assignment. Um, so you may find that certain components do lend themselves to this Elm architecture, just be aware of the trade-offs. And again, we have this chart. The impure part of Elm is, is, again, like these aren't perfect columns, but you call out to JavaScript whenever you want to do something impure, usually. You have these abstractions called ports, tasks, and effects, which I can't go into right now, but those are the in-betweeny things that coordinate between the pure part and the impure part. And the pure part, as I discussed, is the updates and the views. Wow, I am actually over time, shit. Um, <laughs> so, What's the point of all this? Uh, I've shown you two new ways to start writing React components, um, but why should you care? Should you go back to work tomorrow and start using them? No, please don't do that. Uh, for the most part, you should just keep writing your components the normal way. It's proven, it's stable, there's an entire community behind it, and most of the time it just works. But you may find there are specific areas of your app that benefit from these alternative approaches. So at OpenGov, we write lots of React code, and most of it is fairly standard stuff. Um, but there are a few areas where we deal heavily with asynchronous logic or we have state management concerns that are complex enough that set state just doesn't cut it. So in those cases, sometimes we use observables like I showed you, or sometimes we use the Elm architecture. In fact, I have a component that I was just working on a few weeks ago um, that uses the Elm architecture and it uses that RxJS thing I was showing you and it uses Relay and there's even a little bit of Redux in there and that sounds ridiculous, but it actually works pretty well when we keep it um, nice and maintainable by using higher order components to kind of split up the separate um, pieces of logic. And it's actually, believe it or not, more maintainable than the original version that just used the classes. So um, at the end of the day, blah, 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 I'll skip over that part because I'm over. We're just writing React components. Um, so the point here is not to get you to use any particular pattern or library. It's to stimulate your curiosity for how these alternative systems work 
uh, is to get you thinking about how to take full advantage of React's powerful component module, and it's to encourage you to experiment with or steal ideas from other frameworks and bring them back to React. Thank you.